All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome to the show. We got Donnie Moser in the house today. Thanks for joining us, bro. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Dude, it's a privilege to have you on. So so let me give this guy a little intro before I tell you, you know, the little bit of beef I got with this guy because <laughs> he kicked my butt in some sales competitions. And no, we had the privilege of working together at Aptive and uh, very few people beat me on some of those competitions. Donnie is like one of them. And Donnie is a phenomenal sales guy, recruiter, and most important to me, like leader and, and not just in sales. So Excited to have you on, dude. <clears throat> okay, let me give you uh, a guys a quick intro. John, uh, Donnie is president of sales at Aptive, okay? And uh, the, so to put this in perspective, the partners at Aptive make one to two and a half million, okay? Right. And uh, he oversees all leadership training, sales training, area, just stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, how long have you been with, right. how long have you been in the company? 10 years. A decade. Yeah. A decade strong. I like yeah, it. Yeah, it went so fast. It's <laughs> wild. So Aptive has 2,000 reps. With the partnership at Grit, you guys have about uh, 2,500 cumulatively? Yes. Okay. Yep. Sixth largest residential pest control company in America. And for direct sales, door-to-door, -door, you guys are number one. That's right. You guys have been number one for a while. It's, like, been, a, it's been a long time. Like since 2018-ish? I don't even know. It's been... Around there? Almost as long as I can remember. I love it, dude. You know? <laughs> so what I love about you, Donnie, is we were talking about this right before we started, was like you've done so much with sales. And I want to talk about your biggest year too, like selling. And then, uh, dude, you've ran nine Ironmans, five half Ironmans, and then four full Ironmans. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, it, it's been a crazy ride. Why is that? Like, why? Like, we were just talking about this a little bit beforehand, and uh, how salespeople don't push themselves enough outside of their sales goals. Yeah. Tell me why you push yourself like that. That's a good question. So. I, uh, at the beginning of my career, I was just so locked in on sales. Like sales was the only thing that I did. It was the only thing I cared about. It was the, like, I just grinded and grinded and grinded early on. And then all of a sudden, like five years in, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm 33% body fat and 200 pounds and I'm 5'8". And I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided, okay, I've got to make sure that I'm, I'm like taking care of myself because what's the point of making money? What's the point of having a career if, if you're unhappy yeah. or if you're unable to live a long time? Yeah. So I, I immediately, uh, I, I literally remember the day I got on the scale and I was 198 pounds and I was like, I don't want to get over 200. Like what the heck is this? Yeah. And so I immediately started like a diet and a transformation transform my body and then after that it was like okay what more can i do to expand my mind expand my work ethic expand my my uh like ability in my brain to like have more endurance you know yeah and so i found that you know demanding of myself you know physical endurance sports was a good way to kind of like get my brain expanding and get my brain uh fixed so like I believe in I believe in this thing that I made up called the five pillars. Okay, okay? and um, the first pillar is all about goals and habits. But then you know it's how can you increase your work ethic and how can you increase your um, mental toughness. Then you get your attitude. And then you got like the technical skills at hand. Right. right. Um, those so are the five. Those are the five. Okay. So you know, obviously, I was really good at setting goals and habits. But number two, the work ethic and the mental toughness part. How do you actually increase that mm. outside of sales? How do you yeah. how do you work on something to expand your brain power in a different area so that it translates back into your work, translates back into your family, right? Yeah. And so for me, uh, the physical realm was was where I really tried to focus. I love that. I think it's a great, you know, I mean there's three major areas in my life. It's health, wealth, and then relationships. And, uh, I used to have that limiting belief where I've got to hit all my financial goals, all my sales goals. I was that guy who I put the family on the back burner, didn't prioritize that, didn't prioritize my health. You know, for me, it wasn't like I was getting, not getting too big. It was, uh, I was getting too skinny. <laughs> and so I kept seeing the scale go down. I'm like, dude, this is ridiculous. My biggest year adaptive, I was like 168 pounds, just like a twig for six, one, you know, now I'm 207 pounds, but, um, yeah, it's it's cool that you don't have to. From my experience, you don't have to choose between your health and then your like a health goal related goal, and then your sales goals. No, it's all interrelated. Yeah, it's all interrelated. Like you've got to you've got to be taking care of yourself to be able to give maximum effort. 
the things that you want to. There's this quote that I came by uh, with by uh, Vince Lombardi. Yeah. And he says that uh, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Mm. And man, like what a true statement, right? Yeah. You get home from work and you're tired, and so you can't give to your kids at the level that you want to give to your so kids. True. You know, you're out working and you get tired. You're like pouring caffeine down your body. Yep. You know, so unhealthy, right? Yep. So being able to be physically fit and being able to expand your endurance and your mental endurance enables you to be better at work, enables you to be better at, with your family, and enables you to be better, um, you know, at your hobbies. If you're able to just take care of of all that, it all it all interflows. If you're not yeah. if you're not financially doing well, then you're not going to be you're going to be stressed out. Yeah, and you're going to take it out on your family and on your physical goals, right? Yep. Yep. And if you don't have a good family life, then you're just going to be really unhappy in general. Yep. So you're, it all it all flows together. It does. Yeah. And I've noticed having that, you know, your significant other, whoever it is for you, uh, having that person like fully bought in with you is like it, it gives you another level of potential. Totally. It's all about communication. And, it is. And yeah. if you have somebody by your side, like it, it, it truly does maximize who you can be. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I had this conversation with a with a buddy of mine. I said, everybody gives praise to the great athletes who sacrifice everything and the great businessmen who sacrifice yeah. everything. But the people who never get any like credit at all or get any accolades or awards are the good dads and the good husbands. Mm. Nobody ever is like, oh, look at this guy. Yeah. You know, look at how great his relationships are with his sad. kids. And yeah. it is kind of sad, but that's the world we live in of, of, of social media and Instagram and media and, and uh, everything just kind of being at our fingertips and in our face all the time is just success, 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 yeah. success, yeah. success. And I think it's okay to slow down and make sure that things are right. Yeah. Oh, well, I agree. Well, dude, what I've learned is, uh, you don't have to, I mean, it, it's for me, it all comes down to the two biggest assets of our time and money and, and, but time is much more superior because you can't buy it back. You can't get it back. And so time is usually funneled into experiences, relationships, um, you know, and then also takes time to build your health. And so the game for me is how can I le max leverage my time with everything? And so I, all my limiting beliefs about my health, my relationships came down to a prioritization of time, you know? And so what, what, yeah, I think the big thing for that I've learned, and I think our audience could like take from that is you don't have to choose one or the other. You can have both. You can have success. Success to me is what, you know, for everyone is different, but for me, it's fulfillment in all three of those areas of my life and making sure that I feel like I'm giving back and I'm impacting. And, um, you don't have to choose between, you know, your sales goals or your business goals and then that stuff as well. And I think you're a great example where they all funnel each other. They, they push you, you know, yeah, you want to overlap them, right? Over layer yeah. them. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a time when I was going super hard at work and I would try and have, you know, my wife bring dinner to the office, you know, if I couldn't get home, um, there were times where I'd go home for dinner instead of going out and then I'd go back to the office, but we prioritize certain things within our time. And as we communicated, obviously I was making huge sacrifices still, but as we communicated about what we were trying to accomplish together, we we're able to work it out. I, I had this mentor back when I first started. I was 18 years old. Okay. My first job was a I was selling Cutco knives. And I had this uh, guy named Matt Ewan who was managing me. And I remember think, telling him, like, hey, I'm like really stressed out. I feel like I can't fit everything in. And he says to me, Donnie, you can fit everything in your life that you want to fit in. You just have to prioritize it and make sure you're wasting no time. Mm. And I love that because a lot of times we act like we have no time, yep. but how many NBA games are we watching? Yep. How much Netflix are we watching? You know, yeah. I have reps come up to me and they'll be like, Hey Donnie, have you seen this show? Or, you know, have you seen this? Or yeah. they'll say a funny joke. I'm like, what's that from? And they're like, Oh, this show. And I, I don't know what it is. And it's cause I try not to watch TV. Like, like that can't be a priority for me at all if yeah. i want to fit everything that i want to fit into my life exactly i mean you could lower your goals and your targets yeah you could you know that, not just yeah. financial and sales but you could also lower your expectations with your marriage but i love that you don't settle for that um for me i think a big thing that i learned from my personal experience donnie was saying yes to too many things and totally. it's little things like that like hey dude let's go watch the game or let's go out and do uh do xyz you know let's go take a longer lunch whatever it is I, I feel like you have to learn the skill of 
saying no to most things. And I remember studying Warren Buffett when I was 20 and reading that, like that's his, it was number one tip for young people. And I'm like, what does he mean by that? You know? And then sure enough, eight years later, I'm like, okay, that's what he means. <laughs> yeah. I've seen how saying yes to too many things, especially in sales training. And as you grow in a leadership position, salespeople kind of, you know, expect too much of you. And they'll just ask, ask, ask if you just give, 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 give. And you got to guard your time. You got to set up boundaries and you got, there's ways to duplicate yourself through training videos, through uh, leadership and people. And you just have to build yourself enough to attract those people and build that kind of culture. I, I can agree with you more. So, so one of the things that I'm most proud of in my career, I think it's probably like the biggest thing that brings me joy is when I moved from a, a regional manager at Aptive, got mm -hmm. promoted to president. I, uh, what we did is, is we actually promoted two of our division managers that were, that were in my organization to become the partner, uh, or the regional part, you know, partner yeah. for that group. And they kind of took it over yeah. and they increased from 20 to $30 million in a year. Look at that. And you know, some, some might say like, Oh, like maybe they're better than you. And like, we'll heck bring it. yeah, let's, like, take it. let's, yeah. let's make, like, yeah. I, I want them to be better yeah. than me. I want them to do it better than me. And like the reason I'm so proud of it is because I was able to duplicate myself in a way that like kind of handed the reins off yeah, and then they were able to actually go out and accomplish more or do better or be more efficient and in many different ways. And it's such a, it's such a, like, it's just so rewarding to, oh yeah to see how duplicating yourself can make an impact on oh, so dude. many people. Right. And, like, and then, and then your, your own health and your own family as well, because it's, it gives you time. Yes. And, and it, yeah, that, that was the key thing is that I, as I was growing this region, I was never like, there were, there were other regionals adaptive that were, they grew way faster than me out of the gate or mm. they were bigger than me. Yeah. And I just took the strategy of, I'm going to be very methodical. Yeah. I'm going to work harder than everybody else. Which you did. I can testify gonna, that. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to stay longer and I'm going to invest in my people and make them really, really good. Mm. Because if I, if I make those investments with my people and they become like little mini me's and I can copy them and produce more of them, then eventually we'll pass everybody up. And finally, you know, last year, uh, you know, they were, they ended up being the number one group at Aptive. And I'm so proud of that because it's amazing. It's just the compound effect, just little investments over time, yeah. replicating ourselves, delegating and it, and it worked. So what things specifically do you do to like master that delegation or the duplication? So this is a really good question. There's so many people that ask me, you know, or, or will complain, they'll say, Hey, you know, I hired this person, but like, they're just not doing it as good as, as I, as I could do it. Yeah. And so I'm just going to do it myself. Yeah. yeah. And so when you hire people, there's an upfront time investment of teaching them how to do things the right way and making sure they get it right. And it's kind of tedious Yeah. and it's kind of time consuming. Yep. And it's sometimes a little bit annoying because you could just do it yourself. Right. Um, and it's a little bit scary because you could do things yourself. But if you make that time investment with your people and you teach them how to do it right up front, then you've duplicated yourself. Now, yeah. how do you teach them how to do it right? You kind of have to dumb what you do down and turn it into a system to where anyone can do it. Yep. And then it's like building blocks, right? Yeah. So for, for, for my, the way I ran my org, it was, okay, how do I teach everybody to be as efficient as I am at doing a first meeting? Nice. Okay, like a first introductory recruiting hiring meeting. Yeah. Okay, so here's here's how we're going to teach it. And we're going to teach it this way. And they're going to start practicing it. And I'm going to do as many of these as I can. But if I don't have time, they're going to be forced to do their own. That's nice. That was kind of my approach. Yeah. And then once they got good at it, it was like, okay, now we're going to start uh, uh, comparing it to basketball. It's like, okay, we're going to teach you how to dribble with the right hand. Mm -hmm. in the left hand okay now that you can do that let's go between the legs and around the back yeah okay now let's now you let's start building off things yeah now let's add in the second meeting and the third meeting nice. let's go over each objection now so instead of trying to teach them like a little bit about how to do the whole process is just nail the basic thing first meeting totally it's just the same with our you know the sales pitch it's like don't memorize the whole thing. just get the first paragraph down then get the rest of the script down, you know, one at a time, and then we'll start working on nonverbals, paraverbals, whatever. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, now, you know, they, they're called Aptive Prime, this group that I 
they were at Devarte. They changed the name. I was a little bit heartbroken, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, you know, they've got dozens and dozens and dozens of team leaders that are totally proficient at signing, at signing all reps and yeah. doing it. And are they, are they all like 10 out of 10 talented? Probably not. Hopefully not offended if they're listening, yeah. but I can guarantee you they're all eight out of 10 talented or seven out of 10. And there's yeah. different varying between seven and 10, but yeah. seven's the lowest. And so yeah. if you've got dozens of people, seven out of 10, and just putting in the time and turning that crank, yep. you're, you're going to be able to scale something. So you want to make it so dumb that like any salesperson can do it. And then it's just about accountability and work. Nice. Which I want to talk to you about both of those. Dude, one thing I've learned uh, in my career is, you know, the perfectionism side to an entrepreneur or a salesperson can cripple you, especially in the sense that, hey, to replace yourself or have somebody, you know, hire somebody else, whether it's a recruit uh, or, or a manager or just an assistant, if they can do it 70% as well as you, it's well worth it, that cut that 30% is well worth the cost because it's going to free up that extra time for you to move the needle in other ways. So that's one thing I've learned that's been game changers. The 70, 30 rule there, you know, is, yeah. I, I agree with you. And it's like, how are they going to get to a hundred? They have to start doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have to, you have to hand it off and yeah. And allow it. So how do you, I think finding a players is, is key in any, you know, any, uh, management leadership position, like bringing up a, like identifying a players, hiring a players. And then, you know, in your organization, making the B players turn into a players. And then for me, I, you know, C players are cancer, C for cancer. I try <laughs> to avoid them. But in, in our realm, Donnie, where we have technically by on, on the books, when we hire a sales rep, there's literally, literally no risk financially if they perform poorly. So a lot of sales orgs, find themselves in the trap of hiring anybody, you know, if they got a heartbeat, they're hired kind of thing. Uh, yeah. What's the repercussion of that? And I know you don't do it. Why, why do you not, why do you not do it? That's a good question. So let me speak first to, to this. So at Aptive, one of the first things that we did when I went in as president with, uh, with Tosh and uh, Chase and Kyle, one thing that we did is we said, okay, we're going to change the incentive structure so that if you do hire people that are, Poor performers, it does affect you. Interesting. So we aligned incentives. Did you go off a of PRA per rep average? Or um, it's it's kind of a convoluted, complicated system. Yeah. Um, but our partners understand it well. Yeah. And because they were more efficient, because they focused on hiring the right culture and they focused on production per rep versus just hiring at will. Yeah. Um, they actually all Smart. made like twice as much, three times as much as they ever had. So um, if we could extract a golden nugget from this, it's base incentives not on reps not on even production, but on per rep averages. Yeah. Efficiencies, right? Efficiency. Yeah. Efficiency. Nice. So one of the things that I've seen throughout the industry is that companies get into trouble because they're just hiring bodies yeah. in order to try and get revenue. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, what if we could hire less bodies yeah. and get more revenue with Dude, less bodies? That's yeah. That's, and, yeah. and now you've got an efficiency, you know, and, and what happens in a lot of these sales forces, especially in door to door is these, these companies are taking on all the risk. Yep. And they're paying all the rewards to their sales force, which is great for sales reps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but you're wasting so much money. And we've seen, you know, we could name dozens of businesses that have just totally collapsed or just aren't they're, they're shells of themselves because they don't do things efficiently. So yeah. when it comes to hiring, and let's say, let's say that, for example, that you're in a situation at a company where there is no risk for you in your pay structure and you're, you're able to hire anybody. Eventually it comes back to bite you mainly just because it pollutes your culture and it's hard to recruit more a performers yep. when you've got a bunch of C's and D's that are yeah. putting on revenue for you. The, the A's and B's aren't attracted to be there anymore. Exactly. And, and it just kills you long-term short term. You might be able to get like a giant, you might make more than a revenue. Short, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But long-term, if you can't, if you can't create leadership, you have no ability to scale. Yeah. And I've seen it time and time again with our, you know, with, with companies in the space is the scalability isn't there because there's just not enough leadership and you can't attract leadership when, when you don't have anything to attract them with. Exactly. Well, dude, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, you know, it's giving the harder, you know, no up front to get the you know long term win you know and that that the harder no is turning people away trimming the fat 
for us this last year, um, I could have recruited 10 guys or so just doing solar out in Utah. We had two. It was just me and one other guy, and I was still reluctant to bring one other guy on. I'm like, I'm going to focus on me, build myself, and become the man I want to become, change myself a lot, and crush my financial goals and create a system to duplicate myself. And with just two of us, I allowed one guy, uh, we absolutely... I, our numbers were the two of us did equivalent to the average what 25 out here would do. And so what's happened because of that is not only a, a lot less stress and less babysitting, but now we're able to attract higher level people and not just BC players, but like a players to build a team of 20 plus. And then you know where that goes. If we can maintain that pace, all yeah. oh, these guys got it figured out. I want to go work with these guys. Exactly. They know what they're doing. And yeah. so, but then, it, then the next thing for me, the next temptation is, oh, let's get just 20, 25, 20, 30 guys, you know, but I have to maintain the same discipline, trim down, have a smaller group to outperform. So I, one of our core values is not based on, um, reps. Uh, it's based on results. That's it. Just keep things focused on results. And that doesn't just mean monetary, just results for your people. You know, if you build them up as leaders and just physically like what you're doing, I mean, why would they not want to be around you? You know? Yeah. I mean, people look up to you for your sales results. They also look up to you for how you treat your family, for what you're doing on the physical end of things, yeah. for, um, you know, how you, how, how friendly you are, like what's your life like, like there's many different things, different people will look up to different things. And so yeah. I always say, if you're going to be a leader, you've got to be leading from the front in all aspects. Yeah not just your, you know, production aspects. This guy might be doing, you know, a golden door every single year, but he, you know, is an adulterer. Like, you know, do yeah, you, you know, or, yeah. or, you know, or, or he might be, you know, I don't know, a cheater, you know, yeah. in terms of uh, the way he treats his people or he steals, he steal, you know, I don't know. Does yeah. I, I mean, I've seen it all. Yeah. I, I'm sorry to go like, so like no. negative. No, no, in it's, that, it's in that good. lane, but no, like, it's good. Um, and and I'm not and I'm not saying that, you know, I don't ever want to like accuse anyone. Like I I think every single person on earth deserves to be loved with the same amount of love, and every single person is valuable. What I'm getting at is that if you don't correct your mistakes and you're not trying to be the best you can be, you're not going to be able to lead in the way that you yeah. can lead. Yep. People aren't going to follow you. And um, I, dude, I've learned this the hard way. I've learned this the hard way where uh, if you're not pushing yourself in all these areas of your, of your life, you will, your people will see. And the way I've seen it is, you know, you have to be the dumbest person in the room to some extent. If you're not growing uh, and, and if you're leading an organization, you, you can't rely on just your organization and where you're at to keep growing. You have to reach out, which usually requires capital to get in high level masterminds or groups or just like network with people, you know? And for me, it's, it's been this realization of, wow, like I've, I've really got to just maintain this, be the dumbest guy in the room. And, um, and no matter how, no matter where our careers take us, like that's, that's a big focus on mine because if I can develop myself and I keep growing myself, my people around me have something to, to pursue as well, you know? And this is not me saying, Hey, I'm, I've got it right, Donnie. It's just, I found something that I've like, it's, it's kind of like an addiction for me is the pursuit of excellence in every area of my life. And uh, I do it selfishly, but the fact that it has uh, uh, dividends for business is just a side benefit, you know, yeah. and, and more so for the people, because if you, this is one thing my manager taught me is if you want to, uh, the more you invest in your people outside of your work, uh, the more buying they'll have and the more appreciation they'll have, which it, it's, it goes full circle. They'll perform better if they're, if they fill their cup, you know, mentally, yeah. physically, emotionally, uh, relationship, spiritually. They'll, they'll be able to fill other cups, sell, recruit, you know, uh, I think that, uh, sales desperation of, uh, the commission breath comes out in recruiting. It comes out in selling, it comes out in managing, you know, micromanaging reps. And I think if we can just take care of ourselves and invest in ourselves and forget and just go all in on all you for dude, just six months, you'll transform, you'll transform into somebody that will track so much more success. And this, uh, this goes in, in line with, you know, Jim Rohn, right? Mm -hmm. mentor Tony Robbins, the yeah. father of sales and personal development. He said, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And if you do so, because if you just work on your job, you'll, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you'll make a fortune. Yeah. Cause people will follow you. Right. Exactly. And, and I think it's also really important to help people understand no matter what you've done or where you've been or mistakes you've made, you can always improve and there's always opportunity to get better. 
first thing. So it doesn't matter where you're at. I like that. You can start. You can change. You can you can make an impact. Second thing is everybody screws up yeah. and nobody has it perfect, yeah. right? Like we're all on this journey together. It's like a loop. Yeah. And it kind of loops upward. And no matter, like, in fact, the more refined you get, actually the more you realize that you have wrong and that you need to keep getting better. Yeah. Um, but. Dude, I, can I just comment on that real quick? Yeah. Um, when I got divorced, it was heartbreaking. Like it just, that's, that's a massive understatement. Just soul shattering. And I was mostly at fault for it. And, um, with that, there was so much turmoil, so much pain with three kids. And the narrative is, is so much self pity after that for, you know, a while. And, um, but you can, no matter who you are, as I say this to be able to relate to other people, no matter what you've been through, no matter where you're at, what mistakes you've made, you, you don't just have the opportunity to turn around. You have the opportunity to change your life and then inspire others who are that low. Totally. That's what got me up, uh, Donnie was saying, Hey, look, you know, so a lot of ways before I was put up on a pedestal and a lot of it was a facade because everything else in my life wasn't put together and I'm okay with that now, you know? And, um, my thing is inspiring people that, Hey, if you're not perfect, that's okay. Like you can turn it around. And if you invest in yourself, it will have dividends and everything else. Like if you're pursuing your sales goal and you feel like you're sacrificing everything else, that's okay. We get it, but stop because eventually you're going to run dry, you know? And if, if, yeah, and, and run dry could mean a lot of things. So the Piper yeah. has to get paid at some point. Yeah. But I think one of the coolest things about the universe, you know, and, and, you know, God, you know, I would call it God. Yeah. Is that no matter what we do, he's able to fix it and turn it into something positive for everybody yeah. else and yourself, I which is, that. which is so cool that there's like this redeeming principle of, of humanity. Yeah. No matter what you do, where you've gone, you can, you can turn it around and be inspiring. So thank you yeah. for kind of yeah, like spurring that, uh, that thought. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting about like, I, I feel like our world needs more authenticity and, and, you know, just being more real. And this is my girlfriend has really helped me with this so much, but, um, empathy it's related to empathy too. And if you can be real, not put off a facade, you can, you can connect with other people more, you know, absolutely. And which means you'll have more influence selling, recruiting everything. So it's a win-win. And you'll just feel better about yourself. <laughs> totally. You'll be able so, to develop people. And, yeah. You know, you can develop people in order to help them to kind of mold into the person that you think that they can be or that uh, maybe their potential is. And then you also have the ability to recruit people um, to to wanting to be, you know, wanting to improve, wanting to get better. I think one of the things that we run into in our industry is we always recruit with the, you know, with the, the commission you know, the commission breath is what yeah. I think you called it. Yeah. What do you do? To, you what know? do you do to aid that? Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, we want commission or, oh, we're going to make this money or, oh, we want to get these guys or whatever it might be. Right. Yeah. And if you can recruit from an angle of wanting to develop people, mm -hmm. wanting to help people grow, if you can recruit from, from an angle of wanting to teach people and influence people, you're going to attract people that are, that are desiring that. Yeah. If you recruit from an angle of just wanting money, you're going to recruit people that just want money. Yeah. And totally fine. A lot of those people are really talented, but what ends up happening is they just leave. They just leave you for whoever. Yeah. Who whoever pays them the highest. Yeah. yeah. And it might not even be who actually pays the highest. It's just like a percentage or a not, you know, like, yep. like there's so much more to earnings than just like Dude, preach. The, the percentage. Yeah. Like there's the work that goes into it. There's yeah. all the metrics that go into it. There's the leadership with you. Right. Yeah. And if you're recruiting to a culture and not to and not to a percentage or whatever or a commission, then you're gonna attract the right kind of people. Yeah. And you should be empathetic with people that like I'll be honest with you, there's people that come into my office and you can just you can just smell the greed in them, right? Yeah. And there's a difference between greed and ambition. Mm. Okay. I want ambitious guys. Yeah. I love ambitious sales yeah. reps. Greedy reps, though, it's like, ah, I'm going to be a little more careful with this. And then the, so the question becomes, can I develop this person? Can I influence this person? Yeah. Nine times out of 10, you really can't. Dude, I know exactly what type of person you're talking about. I call it vain ambition. It's where they what they want something big. Like you have two types of people. It, most people want something great, but you have those that want it and want to put the work in. Like I've learned I can't even if I get something great, financial, whatever it is but I didn't pay a price to get it. I don't appreciate it. And it's not just me. That's everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, I, I know, I don't know the exact stories about Olympic athletes, but I've heard so many times that they'll do the train for, you know, the Olympic games. And then once they're done, they just feel so unfulfilled. 
you know, it's kind of like when you get to retirement and you just stop working, it's like, well, what am I doing now? Yeah. You know, it's like, what's the point? So, yeah. Well, it's kind of funny you say that going back to Ironmans, yeah. right? Like, like training in an Ironman is so exhausting and it's such a grind. You have yeah. to get up at a certain time every day. How long did it take you to train for your first? Um, I started training in January and I did my first one in April. Okay. So it took me three months. I don't know how, <laughs> so I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how it, like it, be, you want to know why is I was consistent. Uh, so my first uh, week, my first week, I was swimming and I was like, I'm going to drown. Like I'm going to, I'm literally going to drown. And I, I had signed up for a half and it was when the iron cowboy was doing his, his a hundred, his yeah. hundred iron man's or whatever. He did a yeah. hundred one. And, uh, on his 51st, uh, they asked a bunch of people to do it with him. And so I was like, okay, I'll do a full, you know, full. And it was, so it was an official event, Yeah. but yeah, I did the full with the iron cowboy on his 51st. That's um, awesome after training for three months, but it was because I was consistent. Right. Mm. And so, yeah, when, when you finish an Ironman, there's definitely an endorphin release and a dopamine release, but what you appreciate is all the training. Yeah. You actually don't appreciate the event that much. You appreciate yeah. like, what you went through to be able to accomplish. So the you event. became in the process. Yes. Is what I like to say. And that's, and that's so true when it comes to, when it comes to work too. I mean, Aptive had our best year ever from a per rep standpoint in 2023. And when we did it, we hit our revenue mark. I remember looking at the other presidents being like, Hey, we did it. We did I, it. I thought we'd be pouring champagne at each other, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it was like, all right, so let's start next year, you know, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah. you look back on everything that we did to accomplish the goal. That's where like the true joy comes from. That's where the, their memories come from. Yeah. You know, I don't remember, I, I don't remember, I don't even remember the day that we hit our revenue mark last year, Yeah, but I remember, I remember all of the, like the lead up to it. Yeah. You know? Um, so anyway, it's all interrelated. Like you can, you can find the same. So the, one of the reasons why I say you should look at every part of your life and set goals in it is because you can find the same principle on yep. each in each part Yep. and you learn it in a different way. So mm. like your knowledge becomes layered. Oh, I like that. And, and you become more sophisticated uh. and you almost become more, um, more wise. Yeah. Absolutely, Donnie. Sense. Yeah, I, I think when you can find the uh, underlying principles that guide, you know, different types of success, whatever that is to somebody, but you can find the underlying principles. I think that's and that's that's when seeing different, you know, hit a goal in this area of my life or hit a goal here, you know, financially versus physical, uh, in in striving for those, you'll notice different trends. Of, like for example, consistency, discipline, hard work, you know, whatever it is, and so. Uh, I, dude, I remember being on uh, the jet with my mentor, like, and asking, just drilling him with questions. Like, I got this guy one on one. Like, he's not going anywhere. I'm like blasting with questions. Every time I answer, asked him a question, uh, Donnie, he would always reply by not just answering the question, but by teaching me a principle mm -hmm. about it, so that he's just a good mentor. Yeah, right. Yeah. So after about 50 questions, I caught on. I'm like, okay, I was annoyed at first, but now I'm so grateful because you know people ask, oh, is he still mentoring you actively? I'm like, he doesn't need to. He taught me how to fish and, yeah. you know, and so, oh, that's so good. That's yeah. beautiful. And so I've used it to transform my health, my income, my relationships. And dude, um, it's amazing how much can change just from, from this principle of like pushing to do different things in different facets of your life. You should write them down. So practice that I've got into, gotten mm. into is at the end of the week, I write down the things that I feel like I learned. Oh, I love that. Even if it's kind of redundant. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I don't always write down a lot, but I just write down a couple lines. Like, what did I learn from the books I read? What oh, did I learn dude, from the podcast I read? What, yeah. did I, what did I learn from reflecting in the morning? Every single morning I drive in, in a car to the gym and it's silent. I don't listen to music. I don't get jacked. I don't get pumped yeah. up. I just think, mm. you know, I think, I pray, I'm, si I'm in silence. And then I write that stuff down mm. and that will increase your ability to learn at a, at a faster rate. Yep, absolutely. And and when you start learning at a faster rate and you start discovering those principles, it multiplies your success. And it you does. Get quicker and better and you, you make more gains, you make more progress. Dude, I think people just listen to podcasts like this. They listen to audiobooks. They, they read stuff. They, you know, they just go through it so fast in today's world and social media. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like they're absorbing so much, but how much are they retaining? Well, it's just surface level stuff. It, yeah. What, what it ends up becoming is, oh, I got to be successful. I got to be successful, which yep. is, which is fine. And then, and then everybody wants to pivot. Oh, this guy's doing this, or this guy's doing this, or this guy's yeah. doing this, or this guy's doing this. It's like, well, like, let's take a step back. 
okay, let's let's look for the principles within what each of these, you know, successful people are saying. Yeah. How can you apply that to what you're currently doing or what you're most passionate about yeah. right now so that you're not constantly looking for Bingo. something new? Something specific. It could be something small that you can take action on. I love that. Um, dude, one thing when I when I read stuff, I I've slowed down actually. And uh, I read what not like a ham hey, read 10 pages today. It's it's I'm going to read until I find something that I didn't know. And I'll keep going. And it teaches my brain to study differently. And I like then, that. And I study so that I can teach other people, which I think is the highest form of retention when you study that way. So I'm going to steal your golden nugget, dude. Do that Love every that. week. Love I do that. that. I do my little Sunday planning. I think I'm going to start doing that. Uh, yeah. When it's I do a, this it's reflection. A, it's, a part, it's a part of Sunday planning. You know, everybody kind of plans their week out, looks at their goals, reviews them, that whole thing. But I think the, the, the most rewarding part for me when I Sunday plan is just writing down what I learned. And I try to do it every day, actually. So I have a I have a separate journal where at the end of the night. So I'll I'll kind of tell you my night routine. Yeah, sir. it might might be cool, might not be cool. <laughs> so I put my keys in this little teeny drawer where like you put paper clips inside of one of those little like pen holder yeah. things. And the reason I do that is because it's my cue to make sure that I journal before I head home for the night. Mm. Okay, otherwise I forget. Oh, I gotta go home, and you just you just bounce right. Yeah. So it's like oh, there's my keys in there. Okay, can't leave till I do this. Nice. And I write down a couple things that I thought went well for the day. Nice. A couple things that I think I probably could have done better, and then a goal to improve the next day. Nice. Some, sometimes, like if I have more time, I'll write down. I'll kind of score myself on how patient I was, mm. how kind I was, and how focused I was. Wow. On like a one through five scale, and I'll kind of review those every once in a while. But the reason that I do that is because, you know, for example, you're in recruiting meetings all day or yeah, whatever, right? Goes, or you're, goes, in, goes, or yeah. you're in meetings with like your different departments for strategies, you know, whatever. And when you when you actually reflect on the day, it's like, oh, in that moment, I could have asked a better question. Yep. Or in that moment, I was a little bit grumpy. Why was I Why was I a little bit grumpy right there? Well, yeah. because I didn't do this right in the morning. And so it kind of caused me to like have mental fatigue. Yeah. Or, or that that moment that that meeting i wasn't authentic why wasn't i authentic in that meeting why wasn't i why wasn't i real why was i feeling kind of rushed well because this and this happened and so you can start to strategize how you're gonna you know build your day and you can find you can find points where you fall off the wagon or where you kind of get distracted or you get messed up mm. so every day is like game day right yeah so so by doing that, it's like reviewing film almost, yeah. but you're not reviewing film for a sporting event. You're reviewing film for how did you execute your day? Yeah. And, that, and as you compound that over time, oh, amazing. you get super, super skilled at yeah. what you do. Well, dude, very few people like set out every day with direct intentions on how they're trying to move that day towards a goal. And so, you don't have to have a sales job or be an entrepreneur. You can have a goal, but wake up in the morning, have an intention, and then analyze and reflect at the end of the day. Simple thing. So, so here, here's what's crazy. So, so that's my work journal. So then, okay. so then I take the key out, right? And what I realized is when I w when I went went home for the night, yeah. I was on my phone, and I'm not perfect at this. Sometimes yeah. I still go home and Same. I get on my phone. Okay. Yeah. But what what I noticed is that when I went home, I wasn't prepared or in the mental state to be with my family or my kids. Oh, I love that, Donnie. Okay. So I started doing this with the key on purpose to close my day out. And then I'd put my phone, I put music on and I put my phone inside my glove compartment, I'm not mm. texting while driving when I'm going home. Yeah. I'm using that time to like get in the zone to be a dad when I get home. Nice. So I go home, I put my phone in a drawer in my office. And again, I want to emphasize, I'm not perfect at this Yeah. and you don't have to be perfect at it. Okay. You just got to win more days than you lose. I and like eventually that. you win 99% of the days. Yeah. But I put my phone in my office. I eat dinner with my wife. I try to hang out with the kids. I try to put them to bed. Again, not perfect all the time but I'm getting better and it's been so much more rewarding at home because I don't have the distractions of work at my phone. And then around eight thirty nine, when everybody's in bed and everybody's away, then I'll go back down to my office. I'll get my phone out and I'll work again till, you know, 10, 11 o'clock. Dude, I love it. Um, but, and, th and then I'll, I'll sometimes write things down from like the family aspect too. Yeah. Just, just kind of having that reflection because those are the two most important things or yeah. two most time consuming things in my life right now. Yeah. Um, but that's how, that's how I end my day. That's how I, that's how the end of my night goes. And the end of your night is just as important as the beginning of your morning because your night influences your morning. Mm. So again, this whole thing goes back to watching film, right? 
oh, I'm not present at home. Why am I not present at home? Well, I'm on my phone. Mm. Okay, what can I do? You know, put the phone away. Okay, oh, man, I'm not getting up on time to do my swim sessions for my Ironmans. I'm really inconsistent right now. Well, reflect. Let's watch the film. Oh, you stayed up till 1130, midnight, sometimes one, doing A, B, or C thing. Yeah. And okay, delete that. Like nice. let's let's iron that out. Let's iron the evening out so in the morning you're fresh. Right? And so when you watch film or you journal down what you're learning, what you're noticing, you're able to adapt and you're able to get a lot more efficient on accomplishing what your goals are. So money, dude. So much gold there. So many things to unpack there. Dude, from my experience and like that is directly related to everything with sales goals, everything. I mean, it's it's so amazing, Donnie. Thanks for sharing that, dude. Yeah, no problem. I, I, Seriously, awesome. It's a it's a valuable, valuable thing. I feel it like is. that's like one of my secret sauces. Yeah, you know. So. I was just at a 10x conference and um, with Cardone and Brandon Dawson. I went there. There's I, I say I have a filter up because I, I I have to filter up most of this crap. Uh, but I I know there's golden nuggets that they have that I don't know, and so I'm ex- trying to extract those that still align with my principles. And one of them was, he, he said, hey, my success has come down to this, like his success. Uh, waking up every day, setting the target, and then at the end of the day, reflecting and reviewing where am I at. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, that is exactly what you're doing at a very deep level. And it's amazing. And it's so proactive. Like I've been through the same things where I've, uh, you know, I set my phone aside. And sometimes you kind of loosely pull back in. And what you don't realize is there's a compound effect of that extra 15, 20 minutes or 30 minutes of just partial attention with that person has a, like a, a compounding effect on your relationship and then it'll affect everything else. And, totally. and that that's with a very like competent partner. <laughs> and so yeah. I didn't affect me. And so, um, I love that. That's amazing advice, dude. Can I pick your brain before we wrap up on, uh, on recruiting? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about like, if we try to break it down into three phases, okay. Like, uh, for a new guy trying to recruit friends, like strategies, and then let's say you do pretty well and then next phase building a team and then building multiple teams or would you have a better way to kind of organize? Yeah, let's, let's go through those. So if I'm a new guy trying to recruit just a group of friends, so I'm not the team leader necessarily. Yeah. I'm just kind of going out yeah. for a summer or going out with a company and yeah. I want to build a group of five or six maybe or something yeah. like that. I think, so I, I always break people up into different groups. So you have your rider dies. Okay. They're your friends who, are your ride or dies. Yeah. And you need to get them into a meeting with whoever your manager is right away mm. as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. Then you have your friends that you don't, haven't talked to as much. And then you have your acquaintances who you haven't talked to for a while. Um, with those people, you want to ask them for the maximum commitment that you think they will give you. And they will say yes. What do you okay. mean maximum commitment? So some people you might like to say you're talking to an acquaintance. They might, okay. if you reach out and we're like, Hey, I'm doing sales. I want you to, I want you to do a meeting with my manager. They might say, no, I don't yeah, want to no, do that. I see. But like a lunch or like, yeah, a lunch you or, or you know, a, you know, an activity or whatever nice. it is. So, and I'm, fo- I'm, I'm focusing mostly on network recruiting because yeah. that's, that's how I kind of came up was with, ne- with a network recruiting. Now there's all sorts of different things when it comes to leads yeah. You know, lead gen, Instagram, career fairs, all that stuff. What there's have you mil- seen work for guys? Yeah, there's a most. million ways that you can do it. The way I did it was through networks. Got it. Cool. And, and the reason that I did it that way is because I found I could get more A's and B's that way. Mm. I have to filter through so many True. C's and D's to get to the A and B. I like that. And what's funny is the people that sign massive amounts of people through leads and through Instagram and through career fairs i yeah. feel like they have less a's and b's than i did but because i just find them quicker i never signed massive amounts of reps compared to other people but my my reps would always do more than the everybody else's because they're a's and b's yeah right? right so that's just a philosophy that i you know believe in okay but there's a million ways you can do it yeah how do you identify so, like an a or b player for sales good question so Still not. in my first meeting when I am potentially hiring someone, first off, I never hire someone in one meeting. Yeah, There are lots of people that are yeah. like, hey, here's sales, here's money you can make. And they're like, oh yeah, I want to sign up. Okay, cool. Here's the paperwork. Uh, I never do it. Yeah. And the reason why is because I want to evaluate and figure out how serious they are. And I yeah. want to evaluate and figure out if they're an A, B, or a C player. Nice. So I will give them an assignment at the end of my first interview and I'll say, hey, 
I want you to get really clear on what your goals are, nice. really clear on, you know, the plans that you have to accomplish those goals. Yeah. And what are some opportunities that you feel like you might have to, to accomplish those things? If they come back and they've done them, what are they? Mm. Are they an A or a B? Okay. You know, if, yeah. if they, if yeah. they've done them. Yeah. It's a good sign they're an A player. Yeah. What are their goals like? How ambitious are they? How detailed are their plans? Okay. How bad do they want it? If they don't do it at all, well, you know, are they an A player? Even yeah. if they come off all charismatic and talented? Yeah. Like I've hired those guys where you think they're an A player, but it's not. You get what I'm saying? Yep. So just doing that exercise, I get a really good feel if they're good or not. The second meeting is all about expectation setting and all about making what, what, what about working with you specifically is like, is the exclusive thing that you offer, right? Yeah. And it's all about kind of setting up the setting up the path. Nice. Okay. So you're pre-framing. So, yeah. yeah. So the A player, you're setting up the path for what leadership in your, you know, organization looks like. Uh, if it's B, you're probably setting a little bit lower expectations. Yeah. C, even lower, right? Yeah. You set those expectations, you show the vision, you show the model. Okay. Then you, you just have it. At that point, you send them an agreement, have them read it and review it. And then your third meeting, you're either signing them, resolving objections, whatever it might be. That's kind of, nice. that's my process. It's amazing. Um, and I, and I stick to it and I teach it. And the reason I like that process, I can teach it to a bunch it's, of people. You can duplicate it. Teach them how to do it. Exactly. Yeah, I love exactly. that. Donnie. It's powerful. Dude. So that's probably more for a team leader. Yeah. Um, first, first, first year recruiter, just get people in with your manager Yeah. and then take care of them, be the relationship guy, be friends with them, train them like crazy. Okay. Team leader, learn how to do your meetings. Learn your learn your process for how you hire, and then third level division manager or you know regional whatever it might be. As you start to scale past one team, can you duplicate that process with other people? And then you're not training people anymore how to sell. You're training people how to recruit, mm. and that that's a key that's a key a key change. Oh yeah, you're no longer the salesperson. Especially yeah yeah. Now you're now you're training how to hire. Mm. And the, the more that you can train people how to hire and get them good at that process, the more and more people you're going to have. And then strategically, just monitor it. Which I would say, dude, is somewhat like it's for me, it's a lot of it is selling. Not like, hey, I'm trying to get you on, like try to try to sell you on it. But for me, influence and selling is asking the right questions and guiding somebody to a win-win opportunity. Yeah. So you know I mean? the way I look at it is like pest control, especially it's a very transactional yeah. like. And selling that regard is definitely different. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you're closing. It's right? higher, you, higher pressure wins. Yes, yeah. solar, solar. You know, potentially roofing. I'm not really familiar with roofing too much, but it's more of a B two B relationship yeah. style, style sell where you have to, you have to have a lot of follow up. Right. So in that right? sense, it's it's similar. And recruiting is the same. Recruiting is all about. I, I actually I actually lot, read a lot of business to business books mm. in order to develop my recruiting and hiring process. Nice. Because business to business is all about a long term relationship when you sell. Yeah. And the second thing that people don't realize is recruiting is all about leadership. Okay. If you're the better leader, you almost always win. Interesting. You'll almost always win and you'll almost always save your recruit when they want to leave to a different company. So this goes back to our whole conversation here. Yeah. Nice. Exactly. I love that. Exactly. Recruiting is all about B2B skills and, and leadership and attracting, not yep. selling. It's amazing, Donnie. Yep. I like that, man. So gold. Are you asking mostly like mostly asking questions throughout those recruiting meetings? Absolutely. What are some of the key ones you ask? Absolutely. Let's, let's talk about the first one. Yeah. The first meeting, like key questions yeah. that really move it. If you for could you. have one key breakthrough this year, what would it be? Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. What what does life look like? Okay. What are what are things that you're passionate about? Okay. How do you spend your time? Mm. You know? How do you spend your time pursuing those passions? Um, the first meeting is all about figuring out who the person is, what they want. Yep. And then the second meeting, or the, really the end of the first meeting, is kind of figuring out how to hook them. Like, okay, I think I have a way to help you accomplish your goals. Nice. I think I have a way for you to double genuine. down on what yeah. you're passionate yeah, about. Yeah, because you've heard them out. You want to see where they want to go and say, I, I see how this could potentially align. Exactly. Then your yeah. second meeting is all about proving it. Nice. Okay. So you're setting expectations, showing them here. here's basically how we would do this. Yes. Here's what you told me we want. Here's how I see a way to help you get what you want. Exactly. I like that. And then everything from there is just managing concerns. What's some people mean? don't have any and some people have okay. big ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice. I like it, man. Yeah. It's it, money. It, and, and, and you just, and it's just, that's the process. And you just, like I said, I've said this over and over again. You just teach it to everybody else. Yeah. And then everybody else follows the same process. And what I like about that is oftentimes you'll have someone who 
who so there's multiple layers of leadership oftentimes in these organizations, right? Yeah. So you have this beginning team leader who may do a meeting and then they escalate it to their manager. And then they're like, man, this guy's really hard to, to land, but we've got to get him because he's talented. And it escalates to, you know, the president yeah. or the regional or whatever it is. What I like about that process is you just ask him, hey, what meeting is he in? Huh. Oh, he's in his third meeting. Cool. I, you know, I know it's about objections. Interesting. I don't have to redo the first and the second. Yeah. Like that, that process has been done. I know right where they are in the process. Yeah. There's he's something they're held hey, up Review on. the first meeting for me. Review the second meeting for me. They can review it. Now I know exactly where he's at. And I know exactly where to jump in because I've taught the process. Nice. And I know the process better than anyone. Oh, that's cool. So when they come so in, they bring it, you know I know it. exactly where we're at in the process. I'll that's review cool, step one, step two, kind of get on the same page. And then boom, we're off to the races. So Very nice. So there's, there's, it just creates seamless communication between all of the recruiters in the organization for that individual rep. That's very nice. I love that. So that's awesome. Dave. Anyway, dude, yeah, freaking gold. Dude, <laughs> Hopefully super gold. Hopefully everybody gets some value out of that. Oh, absolutely. They're lucky if they listen to this. Well, bro, thank you for coming on. I yeah, appreciate no it. I know you got to get rolling. Yeah. We both got to get rolling. So appreciate Thanks for you. having me. Oh, Donnie, it's a pleasure. Yeah. For me too. Seriously. It's good to see you again. Thanks man. Appreciate you. Thank you.